there's this, there was this harrowing footage, like everybody's worst nightmare who flies, of this gigantic hole in the fuselage of a Boeing 737 uh, from, Amer- from uh, Alaska Airlines. And it turns out there has been a lot of warnings, a lot of warning signs with this particular plane that, for whatever reason, didn't get a lot of attention. And I think a lot of the attention journalistically got uh, devoted, and understandably so, to the just standing like revolving door aspect of how the uh, industry of which Boeing is a part, they had Nikki Haley on the board, they have a lot of friendly regulators inside the government who worked in this industry, go to the government, come back, that famous revolving door. But there's also a significant antitrust component to how Boeing has consolidated power and the ways in which that has resulted in some of these problems. Talk about what those antitrust uh, issues are within this industry. Yeah, no, it's a, um, so I wrote, I wrote a, wrote this up in 2019 when the problems with the 737 MAX first became really obvious with multiple plane, plane crashes. So Boeing was, for most of the 20th century, an engineering marvel. I mean, it was a, a, a place run by engineers. They designed the B-52 in a, in a weekend. They bet the company on the 707. I mean, it really um, tr- transformed one of these sort of institutional jewels of America and the world. And um, in the 1990s, uh, this changed, right? How did we get from this incredible company to a company that can't do anything uh, or, you know, they, they screw up a lot. I mean, they built the lunar module. They're amazing or they were amazing. Um, well, what happened is in the 1990s, the Clinton administration said, hey, um, we have too many defense contractors. The Cold War is over and uh, we're going to cut spending, but we don't want your profits to go down. So why don't you guys all merge with one another? And the Pentagon actually paid the merger costs and also ripped up a bunch of procurement rules. And one of the mergers that took place was Boeing bought McDonnell Douglas. And McDonnell Douglas was uh, a kind of a disaster as a, an aerospace company. There have been a series of aerospace mergers throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And this was the final one. This was the only two remaining civilian aircraft manufacturers of a, of a certain size getting together. And so Boeing would now be the monopolist over uh, the only producer in America, aside, and there's, globally, there was also Airbus. Um, but that's the whole U.S. aerospace industry. And then um, proceed because it had no competition, um, at least domestically, it, uh, you know, the only thing that the management was focused on was squeezing more uh, revenue from tax concessions, uh, from offshoring, from laying people off, and then from squeezing costs out of the manufacturing process. Instead of trying to innovate, instead of having the engineers design cool things, the Jack Welch MBAs got put in charge. And that, you know, you fast forward uh, 10, 15, 20 years and you get disasters like the Dreamliner, the 77 Dreamliner, and uh, and then the 737 MAX. And the 737 MAX happened in 2019. We've known about this catastrophe. Uh, the CEO had to resign, and yet they didn't really change the culture. They put another Jack Welch private equity guy named David Calhoun in charge. And so you fast forward to today, and you know, you've know you got a, a, an emergency exit door that they didn't screw the bolts on because they're using some dumbass supplier, Spirit Aerospace Systems, and they're, they're not investing in, in good workers or in good production processes. It's basically they're just tossing the institution on the trash heap as often happens when you monopolize an industry, because there's no one else to go to. So um, one, one of the, the, the topics you just touched on is one I'm really interested in. I was just by coincidence when I was doing a bunch of research on Bill Ackman over the past several weeks, just because like this person kind of materialized out of nowhere. I mean, he's obviously been very influential in the finance world. Right. That's how he got to be a billionaire. But he's now like, you know, obviously, uh, wetting his appetite for using his vast wealth for political power. So I think it's kind of important to know, like, hey, who exactly right. is this person and where did his wealth come from? And one of the things that he specializes in is buying companies, stripping them all of, of all its value, and then driving up the stock price and then selling them and leaving these companies in rooms, you know, like hauling out American industry and American companies. Right. And this has been, you know, like, look at Bo- if you look at Boeing, 
you know, it is leaving aside like the relationship to the military industrial complex. It is the kind of thing that to the extent you can find good things about American capitalism, it did kind of illustrate this idea that you have engineers who invent things, you have a labor force that builds things, these factories were based in the United States creating a lot of uh, jobs. You had labor unions who were fighting for good paying wages for American workers and it was this kind of innovative industry. And there have been advances in commercial aviation. I think I saw uh, this amazing statistic that there hasn't been a fatal uh, crash of American of an American uh, civilian jet in I think 18 years now, which is obviously you know very impressive. And yet at the same time, you have this other part of the economy that no longer focuses on building. It's just kind of like finance, like just wealth being created digitally and on paper from these financiers and vulture capitalists that rather than contributing anything or building anything, really are about destroying things. Talk a little bit about that distinction, both in terms of how it's played out at Boeing, but then more broadly in, in the American economy. Right, no, that's exactly that's exactly right. And, and what happens, there's a sort of an extractive part of our economy, and that's what finance really is. Finance is effectively, it's a middleman type of, of um, of job, you're supposed to connect the savings of a nation to the investment. You're supposed to run the payment system. And historically, about two cents of every dollar in the economy has gone to finance bankers um, and and other people in that industry. Today, it's about nine percent, right? Which is a hugely inflated amount. And what has happened is that instead of you know we used America used to have kind of our institutions run by engineering types, and and we prioritized making things, uh, whether that's good or bad. I mean, you, you make like it, there's there's definitely uh, America did a lot of bad things. But like, you know, we we had a certain economic order. If you wanted to get rich, you got rich by building a steel plant and running it and selling a lot of steel. And what has happened and this is this is a transformation that really started in the 70s, but but picked up steam over time is that is that we started to move to what's called an asset light model of of production, not really production, where we just sort of move stuff offshore and you would you would have a, a financial overlord class, people like Bill Acton, there are many others, a bureaucratic class are part of it too. And they kind of have this tacit deal with like the Chinese Communist Party and uh, other recipients of offshoring who want to build things for their own strategic reasons. And they would kind of like finance that class and we will offshore things. And so our working class increasingly has less and less power. We increasingly make less and less and more is made abroad. But the, the deal is the US controls the dollar and we, we kind of have this financial parasitic class on top that runs things, makes geopolitical choices, fights over kind of monopoly rents. Like that's one way to see the fight over Harvard that Bill Ackman is engaged in or a lot of these speech fights. Um, it's just a fight among like bureaucrats and billionaires over like over uh, extra rents. But that's essentially like the, 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 you know, you see a kind of like populist resurgence. You see a resurgence of unions. You see a, and, and militant workers who are angry about this. You see like a lot, a lot of the Trump phenomenon was, was a reaction against this. You see um, like a lot of the things that we do on antitrust are a reaction against this uh, kind of high finance model of production. But that's really like that's, I think, kind of the core conflict in America right now. And the cultural stuff is a, is really important. It's a really important part of it because it's, it's a way of disguising what's really going on, where we, which is about prioritizing, you know, the fights among this kind of weird intra, like intra elite fights among this weird finance class versus normal people who actually make things and sell things and grow things and do things for a living. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.